Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I want to start by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me here, uh, also being very, very flexible with uh, scheduling. Um, so let me uh, just, so my assumption sort of was that uh, the audience is going to be a mix of traditions and practitioners. So I try to get a balance of both. Uh, I hope uh, for theoreticians it's not, it's not too imprecise. You can always stop me and, and ask me to make things more precise. Uh, let's, let's actually get started. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is um, scaling behavior of some modern architectures like uh, Mamba or uh, S4. These are state space models. Um, and also some interesting learning paradigms like sharpness aware minimization, uh, which have gotten quite some interest recently in the deep learning community um, as sort of promising designs for training uh, large models. Uh, this work was done uh, jointly with, uh, with Moritz, uh, Jin, and Wolken. So uh, I'm going to start by stating the very obvious uh, that the story of modern machine learning in many ways is really the story of scaling. Um, what you see here on the left is a standard scaling curve, uh, which shows that as you increase the amount of compute that's available to train a model, uh, performance improves in sort of remarkably predictable uh, manner. Uh, this is actually leveraged by many papers. For example, the LAMA 3 paper here, uh, it uh, uses it to predict how much compute is actually needed to get to a performance level below a certain threshold. Um, and the most performant LAMA model here was actually trained with that amount of compute. It's like 10 to the 25 flops. And um, you can actually see the actual performance of the model after training, the, the blue dot in the figure, um, also, also in the plot. Uh, this is a really excellent blog post by Was Barak. Uh, it's titled, The Local Unit of Intelligence is, is Flops. It sort of uh, summarizes the the sentiment of, of this slide is that you know, scaling compute is really one of the crucial components of the success of modern foundation models. So um, of course, it's natural to ask, can we simply scale up a model and get better performance forever? Um, the answer, of course, is, is no. Uh, we need to have some sort of principal scaling rules. Um, so there's this um, uh, example here. This is a figure from one of our papers. Uh, what we do here is um, we train a Mamba model of different widths from 256 to 4096. Uh, darker is wider. And you see that as you increase the width of the model, performance actually starts to deteriorate. Already quite moderate widths, like, like a width is 1,000, and you already see that the performance actually starts to get, get worse as you increase the width of the network. Um, and there are many such examples in literature, like with the NTK literature, for example. Um, so, as I said, we need principal scaling rules to get this more is better sort of phenomena. Uh, let me sort of maybe specify what do, what do I mean by a scaling rule. Um, so this is like a very, very broad high level definition. It's like as you, um, so how do you adjust the model architecture, your hyperparameters, your training procedures, as more and more compute becomes available to you? Right? Like it's a very, a very broad question. Um, one example of a scaling rule would be if you compute your, uh, sorry, if you double your compute power, you might want to increase your width by square root of two, half your, run, half your learning rate, and keep everything else constant. This, this could be one scaling rule, for example. So from a practical perspective, you, um, if you want to be able to train really exceptionally large scale models, the fundamental goals of scaling are, there's at least two criteria that you want to satisfy. There can be more. The first is optimality, which is you want to scale models such that the very large scale model that you get is highly performant at large scales, among possibly other ways of scaling it. Um, I mean, it does not need uh, much motivation. But the second one is actually predictability. So you want to make sure that the performance of these very large models are somehow predictable from smaller scale models. So why should we really care about this? Um, it's because if you want to efficiently explore the design space or do any kind of model specific tuning at all, you need to be able to experiment with at small scales because it's just prohibitively expensive if you want to scale the model at this, uh, at this uh, level. So 
um, sort of, so this is from a practical perspective. If you, if you look at it from a more theoretical standpoint, you're really asking for two things. First, you're asking for your, the scaling limit, where you increase your amount of compute to infinity under some scaling rule. And uh, you look at whether the limit that you get is actually optimal in some sense. Uh, from predictability point of view, you're sort of asking that your, uh, but the finite width models are as close as possible to this optimal scaling limit. So um, how do we identify optimal scaling rules? Uh, one idea would be you can, uh, as I said, theoretically derive the scaling limit, which is the limit, uh, limiting model that you get by scaling the compute to infinity under different scaling rules, and identify those that give you some optimally uh, optimal limiting models in some sense. That's, that's one way you can do this. Um, in such broad generality, of course, it's like almost impossible to, uh, it's not impossible, it's currently really difficult to get uh, scaling limits under all possible rules. Um, but the community made a lot of progress in this area. Um, and I'm sure uh, Boris, Blake, and some others uh, have already given uh, intro into this uh, topic, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, so perhaps the most commonly studied type of limits are the infinite width limits, where you uh, scale the width of the network to infinity, but you keep uh, all the other uh, parameters, like the depth or the data size or pretty much everything else constant. Uh, here, depending on how you choose your initialization, how you choose your uh, optimizer, uh, you get different kinds of limits, like the NTK limit or the mean field or mu p limits. Um, there are other very interesting limits, uh, which are where you scale both the width and the depth of the network, but you do it at uh, different rates, like exponentially or linearly, and so on. So, so there's different kinds of limits. What I'm going to do in this talk is um, I'll discuss how we can use scaling theory, or in particular, infinite width theory here, to understand the scaling behavior of different designs and identify optimal scaling rules uh, for these designs. So I'll basically use two examples. Uh, the first is uh, I look at the dynamics of uh, different variants of sharpness-aware minimization uh, in the infinite width limit. Uh, we'll do this for different architectures. Uh, I'll then talk about uh, modern state space models, like Mamba and S4, and how they behave in the infinite width limit when you train it with SGD. So um, this talk is based on these two papers, both of, uh, both of them sort of very recent, the sort of our en entry topic into this, uh, into this area, really. Um, so it will be presented this year at New Europe's. So let me um, start by talking about sharpness of minimization. Uh, so there is this popular belief in deep learning, uh, which is supported by empirical observations, that flat minima tend to generalize better than uh, sharper ones. Uh, the intuition here. Uh, is that for flatter minima, training and test functions tend to be closer than for sharper ones. So uh, this actually motivated many, many algorithms that explicitly penalize sharpness to get uh, better generalization. Uh, sharpness of minimization is one such update rule. Um, I'll start by describing the uh, vanilla SAM, SAM update rule. Basically, if you, if you look at it, um, it really looks very much like the STD update rule, except that Instead of computing the updates at the current weight, you're going to first perturb the updates in the direction of the gradient, and you evaluate the gradient at the perturbed weights. And then you use the gradient that you evaluate at the perturbed weights to update the original weight. So that's, that's like the vanilla SAM update rule. It's sort of a first order approximation to a min-max problem, which tries to uh, minimize the worst case sharpness within a ball in the parameter space. Um, so we'll denote the uh, weight perturbation by epsilon. Uh, it is indexed by the layer index and the time index. And it's formally defined as the normalized gradient uh, at the current parameter, uh, which is scaled by some perturbation radius row. And it's uh, been shown uh, in certain settings, like the, the convex quadratic objectives and so on, uh, that it probably reduces some Hessian-related statistics, like the maximum eigenvalue of the Hessian. Uh, towards more flatter minima. So uh, let me just show some empirical results. Um, so this is uh, another figure from uh, one of our papers. Uh, what we are doing here is, uh, well, what the slide basically shows is that SAM improves generalization 
uh, across many architectures and data sets. And this seems to be particularly true for, for vision tasks and language model fine tuning tasks. Um, so what this figure shows is um, test accuracy versus uh, perturbation radius for vision transformer, uh, vision transformer models trained at different widths. The dashed lines are Adam W baselines, and uh, the solid lines are, of course, SAM for different perturbation radii. And what you see is for the largest width, you get about 8% improvement in VITs uh, with SAM on ImageNet. Um, so there's many other papers that show similar results. Uh, another paper here from Miller, Miller et al., uh, which shows that for different SAM variants, if you train VITs on CIFAR 10, you have about 6% improvement uh, there. Uh, there's many other papers that show similar results. So the key question that we are interested in here is how does SAM behave as you scale up the width of the network? Um, we're, we're going to hold everything else constant, like depth is constant, data size is constant, depth is constant. So we're going to start with the setting of a, a L hidden layer uh, MLP. Uh, it has width n, you train it with SAM, this is the standard iterative computation of the MLP. Uh, I denote H for my uh, pre-activations, X is my activations, F is my function output, uh, W are my parameters or weights. Uh, everything is indexed by the layer index and time index where appropriate. Um, so if you want to understand the scaling behavior of SAM, you sort of need to start from some scaling rule. Uh, as we don't really have some guidance for exactly how to choose your scaling rule for SAM, we can start with some STD scaling rules. And typical scaling rules, uh, also called parameterizations for SGD, typically scale like the learning rate and the initialization variance. There are other ways of doing it, but this is just one choice we make for this, uh, for this talk. You, you scale the learning rate and you scale the variance of initialization. Um, one example is this uh, standard or default parameterization, which is um, essentially what we use in practice for, for deep learning. This is just he or liquid initialization, uh, where the variance of your uh, weights scales as one over n, and you have a learning rate that's just order one. So that's, that's one uh, scaling rule that's used in, uh, for SGD. Uh, another sort of uh, quite interesting scaling rule is the maximal update uh, parameterization. This has gained a lot of attention in the, in the last couple of years, uh, especially because it, is, it yields lots of practical benefits. Uh, this is very similar to the mean field parameterization that's studied in, in, in many other works. Uh, so this is how mu p is defined. It's, it's called mu p in short. Um, you basically start from your standard initialization. You scale down the learning rate and the initialization of the last layer. This already sort of transitions your model from kernel regime where no features are learned to the feature learning regime. Um, and then by scaling up the learning rate of the first layer, you sort of effectively learn features in every single layer. So that's, that's sort of the, the mu p definition. Um, so Basically, as I said, um, under this parameterization, you are able to achieve uh, what I call effective updates in every single layer. Basically, what this means is the update of every single parameter or layer has some non-trivial effect on the output of the network. Uh, this also means that the features in every layer evolve at a width-independent rate. Uh, and MUP is actually within some class of parameterizations, which is rather broad, actually. It's, it's a unique uh, scaling rule with this kind of a property. So as I mentioned, there are many practical benefits to MUP. Um, it often shows better generalization through the mechanism of feature learning. Uh, um, and uh, there's usually monotonic improvement with scale. You can see in this uh, plot here. Um, so these two sort of reflect the optimal, optim optimality property that we talked about earlier from a, from a practical standpoint. And um, moderate width neural networks tend to be uh, well approximated by their infinite width limit. So sort of suggesting that you're somehow closer to the limit. Um, and s another related uh, observation and quite interesting practical benefit is that you can actually transfer your optimal learning rate from small scale models to large scale models. Uh, also indicating that the finite width models may potentially be closer to the, to the limit. So uh, again, to, to understand how SAM scales with width, we can parameterize the initialization variance and the learning rate according to some scaling rule that gives you stable SGD dynamics. Right? So we're going to use that to parameterize SAM. Um, and we're going to train the network with the SAM update rule using some width-independent perturbation radius. 
So before I talk about the results, let me make a quick distinction between weight perturbations and activation perturbations. So weight perturbation is this uh, vector, epsilon t, by which you perturb your current weights and where the weight update is uh, uh, evaluated. Uh, and your activation perturbations are basically the difference between the two forward passes um, uh, when you compute the perturbations. So weight perturbations induce activation perturbations. So activations may be perturbed because the weights in this layer are perturbed or any other weight in the previous layer are perturbed. That's, that's basically the distinction. So how, how are we going to approach this? We're going to sort of analytically compute the infinite width limits uh, of uh, neural nets that are trained with SAM uh, at any fixed time. Uh, we use the uh, tensor programs theory to, to do this, basically. Um, so the, this is the first result uh, that we have. So what this shows is uh, for any fixed width independent perturbation radius row, the dynamics becomes unstable with width, uh, SAM dynamics, and the output function basically diverges after one step of SAM. Okay. This holds under any parameterization that gives you stable dynamics under SGD. You can use mu p, you can use silicon with uh, 1 over n learning rate, both are stable scaling rules. And under uh, any such parameterization, uh, this basically uh, explodes. So here is the empirical illustration of the result. Uh, what you see here is a 2D grid of learning rate and perturbation radius. Uh, the values, lighter values indicate um, higher validation accuracy. And from top left to bottom right, you're increasing the width from 64 to 4096. And as uh, you can see, for any fixed perturbation radius, as you increase the width, uh, you get unstable. And essentially what we are saying is the maximally stable perturbation radius shrinks as you increase the width of the network. So this, of course, suggests that we need some sort of a global perturbation scaling for, for your perturbation radius. So that's exactly what we do. We introduce uh, some global perturbation scaling uh, rho n to the minus t uh, is, is how we scale the perturbation radius. And under this scaling, we sort of observe three different regimes. Uh, first, you have, if d is less than half, you get the unstable regime. This is where d equal to zero sits. For d larger than half, uh, SAM dynamics trivially collapses to SGD dynamics at any point in training. Uh, and d equal to half is the only non-trivial choice, where you have some non-trivial SAM behavior. Um, again, let me just show sort of an illustration of the result here. Uh, we have the same figure here. Now, uh, instead of uh, training with uh, the standard uh, SAM with no scaling of the global perturbation radius, we're going to use d equal to half here. And under the scaling, you can see that the maximally stable perturbation radius now gets uh, you know, uh, stable. Right? It's independent of width. However, um, turns out that even with the choice of d equal to half, which is the only non-trivial choice of global perturbation scaling, uh, you're effectively only perturbing the last layer weights and activations if you just use uh, this global perturbation scaling. So um, this is sort of, again, this holds for any uh, scaling rule that gives you stable dynamics under SGD. Um, uh, this is, again, an illustration of the result. On the top, we have appropriately normalized uh, weight perturbations. On the bottom, you have appropriately normalized activation perturbations. And uh, what you see is, uh, so we have this for the input layer, the hidden layer, and the output layer. Um, so this is like a three or four layer neural network. The hidden layer so figure sort of looks the same for all, all hidden layers, really. Um, and what we do here is uh, we train MLPs with different widths using three different algorithms, and we plot the statistics here. Uh, the first is the standard SAM. Uh, that's shown in blue. Uh, then we have, oh, sorry, yeah. This is possibly doesn't matter as a question, but so when you're running SAM in your analysis, are you, are you doing the kind of approximate SAM where you kind of approximately yeah. solve this minimax problem, yeah. or are you assuming yeah. you kind of totally solve it? No, approximately solve it. And would there be any difference if you were doing it, totally yeah. solving it versus approximately? Does that make a difference or not really? I, it would depend on how, uh, how uh, on your approximation. I think solving it exactly, it, it would matter. It would matter. So we have different variants of SAM, each a different approximation to this original problem. Each of them has a different scaling. So, yeah. And the radius, you know, the vector that you're normalizing, you're normalizing that with like L2 norm, is that right? Uh, are you talking about uh, this, this normalization? Yeah, what's that yeah, it's norm? A norm. It's a Frobenius norm? Yeah. It's the, uh, the it's L2. actually the total Frobenius norm of your entire uh, weight, weight parameter. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah so I mean, <clears throat> 
since these parameterizations are, are well, okay. So in mu p are all all the weights uh, changing order one? I don't know. I, I guess what I'm getting at is like you would maybe expect different layers to behave differently. So under mu p, you have the behavior that uh, there are different ways to parameterize mu p. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at the one where you parameterize with the initialization variances and your and your learning rates. Yeah. In this particular version, um, the the you're talking about the normalization in particular, right? Yeah. Well, not, it's not balanced. They they actually are different. Yeah. So yeah. but that's not reflected in the norm, is it? Uh, or it's in the not reflected. Radius? It's not reflected here, but yeah. we take that into into account when we do the analysis. I see. To, to get the final scalings, yeah. Uh, what I'm saying is, like, the, the way you're scaling right now, there's a norm. Yeah. And the norm is treating all the layers identically. Yep. Yes. So, I mean, maybe this is what you're going to have to tell us, but I'm, I'm wondering if you consider treating the layers differently. Uh, we have analysis for those as well. From a scaling point of view, they they scale differently, but from a performance point of view, they actually doesn't. It doesn't seem to matter how you do it. You can take the whole norm, or you can take individual uh, norms and do it separately. But it, the, performance wise, it doesn't seem to matter so much, as long as you have some normalization. Without normalization, uh, there's there's some analysis that you can you can get stuck in saddle points, uh, but as long as you have some normalization, it's actually fine. Seems. I mean, just question that. Well, I mean, my experience empirically has been that you can just take this norm out, and performance is always the same. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure about that. Uh, this, at least, I know some theoretical analysis which says which says that without the normalization, you can get stuck in saddle points. But if you have this normalization, you can sort of slowly escape through Hessian induced noise. So, um, so th there's there is evidence that this normalization actually is necessary. Any other questions? All right, so let me go to the, the result here. Um, as I was saying, um, yeah, so we have three algorithms here in the plot, uh, SAM STD, SAM STD LL, and SGD. So let me explain what, what they mean. So the blue curve is SAM STD, which is just using SAM with STD as the base optimizer. Uh, SAM STD LL, again, uses SAM with STD as the base optimizer, but we're only going to apply it to the last layer of the network, meaning we're only going to perturb the last layer, every other layer, which is going to set the perturbations to zero. Um, and it, yeah, STD is just a standard STD baseline. As you can see, when you increase the width of the network, except in the last layer, where you have non-trivial perturbations, uh, as for sufficiently large width, your perturbations basically go to zero. Um, so basically, what, what this means is, even if the perturbation radius is properly tuned, which is standard practice in SAM, only the last layer is actually being effectively perturbed uh, in the limit. And empirically, at least under mu p, you see that it holds already for practically finite widths, arguably practically finite widths. Um, computational standpoint, you can actually remove the uh, inner backward pass and close the gap to the computational uh, cost of STD. So for SAM, you actually have two forward passes, two backward passes in every iteration, so it's twice the computation. So at least by removing one backward pass, you can close the gap. But uh, I guess it's actually not, if you believe in the promise of SAM, that SAM actually gives you better generalization, this probably isn't optimal for generalization. Yeah? So one question is that, so you do perturbation, right? So I consider that whether it depends on the batch size, but I yeah. are using very small batch size. Yeah. Is that useful for the perturbation? For example, I just in one data point. Yeah, uh, so for the analysis, we can have one a single uh, data point or a fixed batch size. Um, Performance-wise, it seems that smaller batch sizes tend to be better for SAM. Particularly, there is this M sharpness notion that to compute the perturbation, at least you need a smaller batch size, even though for the update, you can take a larger batch size. Right? Um, OK, so. Uh, in order to be able to perturb every single layer effectively, we need to introduce uh, additional hyperparameters, which is layer-wise scalings of the perturbation radius. Uh, we'll define a class of parameterizations we'll call BCD parameterizations. This extends the ABC parameterizations that, that Greg Young introduces in his Tensor Programs uh, papers by introducing layer-wise scalings of the perturbation radii. Um, so essentially, what uh, this class constitutes these kinds of uh, uh, scaling rules. You're going to initialize uh, your weights as uh, IID Gaussians with uh, uh, standard deviation n to the minus BL. So that's the B of the BCD parameterizations. Your learning rate in each layer is scaled with n to the minus CL for each layer. 
And you have global and local perturbation uh, scalings. So for each layer, you scale the gradient with some n to the minus dl. And you, after the normalization, you also have this n to the minus d on the side. There, there are many ways of doing it, but this is just one choice that we have here. Um, and before discussing the results, I'll just introduce two notions. First is the maximal feature perturbation scale, which uh, sort of denotes how much is the last hidden layer activations uh, perturbed uh, as a function of uh, width. So basically, if r tilde is 0, then your features in the last hidden layer are evolving at a width independent rate. Right. Um, similarly, you have the maximal feature update scale. Uh, this is how much the last layer activations are updated, uh, again, as a function of width. If r is 0, then your features in the last layer evolve at a width independent rate. Okay. Uh, any questions here? Right. So uh, the, the way to think about this is these different parameterizations give you different infinite width limits, and we're going to try to understand what kind of behaviors they sort of exhibit. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, have until 11. 10, OK. OK, thanks. Uh, so the question is, uh, what is the ideal SAM behavior in the limit? What kind of behaviors are we looking for here? Uh, we can use like the results that we just got sort of to motivate uh, this line of uh, uh, discussion. First, we want stability. Of course, we want optimization dynamics to be stable. Uh, we want perturbation non-triviality, meaning we don't want SAM dynamics to just trivially collapse to SGD dynamics. We want at least some non-trivial SAM behavior. Uh, we want effective updates, similar to SAM, uh, SGD, or Adam. You want the updates of every layer, uh, every parameter, to have a non-trivial effect on the activations of the function output. Um, and the last uh, is effective perturbations. We want each layer or parameter to be effectively uh, perturbed in the limit. Otherwise, you can simply set perturbations to zero and save compute. Um, so if you, if you want to perturb some layer, you should be able to do it effectively. Uh, so to define it, it's uh, defined similar to the uh, updates. Basically, that the effect of the perturbation in every layer, the weight perturbation in every layer, has an order one effect on the activation perturbations or the function output. So that's, that's what it is. Um, uh, th this is. This is a postulate that uh, for SAM, you need to be able to have both effective updates and effective perturbations if you want to be able to transfer optimal hyperparameters from small scale models to large scale models. Because without that, there might be uh, some uh, additional finite sized approximation error that you may want to. So uh, I'm going to skip these uh, for now. These are just characterizations of, of these different, different things, how, which kind of parameterizations give you which kind of properties, like what are stable, what are. Uh, perturbation non-trivial. I'll sort of show the summary slide in a second. So this is uh, one of the key results, which shows that if the, um, again, that's just the definition of effective perturbations. And we're characterizing which PCD parameterizations give you effective perturbations. So essentially, what this uh, shows is um, if your parameterization has initialization variance that's too large, then there is no scaling of perturbation radii that gives you effective perturbations in every layer. Uh, that, that simply doesn't, doesn't exist. But if your initialization variance is small enough, then you have a unique stable choice of your layer-wise perturbation scalings uh, that gives you effectively effective perturbations in every layer. That's sort of, uh, sort of the result. I'll sort of summarize this a little bit more uh, in the next slide. Um, so uh, essentially, if, if uh, so this is effective perturbations. And for effective updates, Essentially, as long as your, uh, as your parameterization satisfies stability with respect to the output of the function, the features, and the uh, perturbations, then uh, mu p is still the unique scaling rule that gives you effective updates under SAM. It doesn't give you effective perturbations, but it gives you effective updates. Okay. So uh, this is sort of the summary of the key results. Um, uh, this is a 2D plot here. Um, and since mu p achieves effective updates uh, under SAM as well, we uh, parameterize the variance of initialization and the learning rate according to mu p, and ask what kind of behaviors do you get for different choices of layer-wise perturbation scaling. Right? And the 2D plane here uh, shows you r tilde, which is how much your last hidden layer uh, per features are perturbed, and d plus dl plus 1, which is how your last layer uh, weight perturbations are scaled. 
so so that's that's this plane. Yeah. Um, there's this. Uh, so what you see here is for the majority of scalings, you have uh, unstable perturbation dynamics, um, where either the last layer weights have too large perturbation scaling, or you have the last hidden layers simply diverge uh, in their perturbations. So that's that's the unstable region. You have the dark orange region where you have this perturbation triviality, meaning SAM dynamics just collapses to STD dynamics in all of these um, uh, regions. So either your last hidden layer um, is not sufficiently perturbed or the last uh, layer weights are uh, perturbed too little. And then the two orange lines where you have uh, at tilde is zero and the D plus DL plus one is one. So for these two lines you have, these are the only scalings where you have some non-trivial SAM dynamics. Um, and there is this mu p square, which is the uh, sort of the green, green uh, little box there. Um, this is the, uh, under the scaling, your features are perturbed at a width independent rate, so r tilde is zero, without actually uh, the network becoming you know, divergent or unstable. This is actually not the case in other parameterizations. To, to contrast, let's look at what happens under standard parameterization. So we have a very similar figure here, um, except uh, what happens is the last hidden layer cannot be effectively perturbed, uh, meaning you see that r tilde cannot be zero without actually the function becoming diverging. So you, you have one of the two behaviors. So now let me show some, some empirical results. Um, so what we see here um, is different parameterizations, mu p and some variants of mu p, like global scaling and uh, you know, mu p square in blue, and the sp variants are in, are in green. Uh, we train, um, I think these are MLPs trained on CIFAR 10. And what you see is uh, dash lines are again Adam W, I think they are Adam W baselines. Yes. Uh, no, these are, sorry, these are SGD baselines. And what you see is uh, for mu p square, you actually get better generalization under SAM over all other the variants. And um, what is also very interesting is that under mu p square, we get both optimal. Uh, learning rate and the optimal perturbation radius to transfer across scales. So um, let's focus on the bottom two plots. On the left, so what we're seeing here is the landscape of hyperparameters uh, perturbation radius and learning rate. Uh, we're training MLPs of different widths. Darker is wider. The unstable regions are the gray and the black regions in the plot. And uh, left is mu p global, where you have just mu p with global scaling of the perturbation radius. On the right, you have mu p square with this correct layer wise scaling of the perturbation radius. And as you see um, for mu p global, there's a considerable shift in the perturbation radius. There's also a small shift in the learning rate as well um, as you go, grow from a small width to large widths, as opposed to mu p square, where you have a pretty consistent uh, uh, hyperparam optimal hyperparameters. So these, these contours are actually um, so regions of the HP space, uh, hyperparameter space that are within, uh, I think, 1.5% of the, of the maximum accuracy. That's, those are the contours. Yeah. Is the same learning rate here? Okay. Sorry, uh, can you okay. do So in the plot on the top, they're using the same learning rate, or you tune the learning rate? Uh, this, the learning rate is tuned. So we always do a grid search. Yeah. OK. OK, so um, this same analysis can be extended to other variants of SAM uh, and also other architectures. Uh, for example, there's uh, two uh, quite popular variants of SAM, layer-wise ASAM and element-wise element ASAM. I, I won't go into detail here, but these are sort of motivated by sharpness definitions that are invariant to some rescaling operations that leave your function output um, invariant. Um, and this table sort of shows for different variants of SAM, uh, under global scaling, which layers are perturbed and which layers are not perturbed. Uh, and if you want effective perturbations in every layer, how you should be scaling every single layer. That's, that's what this table, table sort of shows. Essentially, we have a simple rule to derive the correct scaling for any SAM variant under mu p. It also holds for other architectures, which is that for maximally stable perturbations, for effective perturbations in every layer, if you're using mu p as your initialization variance and your learning rate, then you scale your uh, perturbations like you scale your updates. That's, that's sort of the rule. So uh, some more empirical results here. Uh, so on the left, we have ResNet 18, trained on CIFAR 10. Uh, blue curve is mu p square, gets better performance through our training. Uh, 
ResNets is a little bit tricky. The, the performance is already quite saturated, so you only get mild performance improvements there. Um, on uh, vision transformers, this is a plot we already saw before. We actually get transfer of this optimal perturbation radius uh, across widths. Again, Adam baselines. So these are Adam baselines, and these are the dash lines. And for Sam, you see, again, quite a bit of improvement. And also, the row is stable. Uh, this is the result for, for ResNets on CIFAR 10 with different SAM variants. Um, so one thing that's sort of interesting to point out is, um, so through, throughout our work, we found a few examples like these, which is we can actually use these kinds of scaling analysis to sometimes uh, explain empirical phenomena, even at moderate scales. Um, so I have an example here. So our analysis shows us, for example, in the table there, for which variant of SAM, which kinds of layers are perturbed and which ones are not, if you do global scaling. So global scaling basically means you're fully tuning your perturbation radius, right? Like you can, you can think of it that way. And uh, as an example, for layer-wise ASAM, it says normalization layers do not get perturbed even if you tune the perturbation radius properly. And this is sort of an empirical result that people found in literature already. Um, the, the orange curve here, the solid line, is where you perturb all layers. The dotted line is where you remove the normalization layers from your set of pertur perturbed weights. So you don't perturb the normalization layers. Essentially, it shows that if you remove the normalization layers, there's basically no effect on the, on the curve. Uh, you see something similar for standard SAM. Again, uh, analysis says standard SAM normalization layers do not get perturbed under global scaling. Uh, and this is also what you see in, uh, in practice. Uh, for element-wise ASAM, on the other hand, normalization layers are perturbed under global scaling, and removing them have significant effect on performance, in particular because uh, there's one argument that normalization layers are actually quite important for, for performance from a SAMS perspective. Um, there's um, another interesting thing that we've, we find in, in the analysis here, which is that if you actually correct for the perturbation scalings across different SAM variants, we, we see that performance gaps between the different SAM variants actually tend to vanish. There's no performance gap between, between the different SAM variants on many tasks uh, as soon as uh, we fix the perturbation scalings. So it's also quite, quite interesting that um, uh, performance gaps are due to this, this uh, you know, different scaling behaviors. So um, just need to check time. 10 minutes, OK. All right, uh, I'll try to spend the last uh, 10 minutes talking about uh, scaling behavior of uh, a uh, model class called Structured State Space Models, uh, which have, again, attracted a lot of attention recently in the sequence modeling community. Uh, examples include like the S4 model or the Mamba model. Um, and uh, so let, let, me, let me just get started. So being able to efficiently capture long-range dependencies in data is one of the central challenges in sequence modeling. Uh, unfortunately, though, most models, including transformers, are shown to perform uh, quite poorly on tasks that involve reasoning over long ranges. Uh, for example, you have this long range arena benchmark, where you see that none of the sequence model, including transformers, actually do better than random guessing on this path X task, which involves being able to determine if two points on this 2D image are actually connected by a path. There are distracted paths often, so it makes the task uh, challenging. Uh, this motivated rapid research for models that can efficiently capture long range dependencies. Uh, and structured state space models like S4 or Mamba are arguably the most prominent among these kinds of models. They actually dominate the uh, long range arena benchmark and also uh, benchmarks that in, uh, involve modeling continuous time signals like audio and, and also video. Um, so let me start by giving a very high level overview of what structured SSMs are. Uh, I'll start with the S4 model from, from Gu et al. Uh, there are many interpretations to this model, and this is just one of them. Uh, you can arrive at the structured state space model by starting with a continuous time SSM and making a series of modifications to address some of the key issues that they have. So, uh, so you have a continuous time SSM here. It's parameterized by three parameters, your state transition matrix, compression matrix, and reconstruction matrix. Um, and continuous time uh, SSMs tend to struggle actually with uh, modeling long range dependencies uh, usually. So uh, efficient parameterizations of the state transition matrix um, are shown to perform uh, quite well in better modeling long, long range dependencies. 
Um, so so the, these are called HIPPO parameterizations. They have basis in like online function approximation theory. And the S4 paper states, for example, that if you replace a uh, random A matrix by this HIPPO matrix, on like the sequential MNIST task, your performance jumps from like 60% to 98% or something like that. Um, so what is relevant for our discussion here is these matrices tend to be highly structured, like polynomially decaying eigenvalues. Uh, the next thing we do is discretization. So to be uh, applicable for discrete signals and to make training and inference uh, efficient, continuous time SSMs are actually discretized to get these uh, linear recurrent kind of networks. Uh, since there is no nonlinearity in this linear recurrent network, you can actually efficiently parallelize it um, using uh, some con equivalent convolutional representation. So um, while models like S4 and other variants, as I explained, uh, dominate the long-range arena, uh, and also like continuous time signals. They don't actually match the performance of attention-based models on language modeling tasks, uh, or uh, tasks that have more discrete and more information-dense uh, kind of data. So the MAMBA paper basically argues that this is because um, structured SSMs, like continuous time SSMs, uh, or linear RNNs are time invariant. They can't selectively choose which parts of the input they should selectively focus on. Uh, so to alleviate this, the MAMBA model comes up with this selection mechanism where you allow the uh, reconstruction and the compression matrices to depend on the input. So you just parameterize them as linear, linear models with some trainable weight parameters, WB and WC. Um, and your, uh, so these are called selective and structured state space models. So this is the S6 layer, which is a key component of the, of the MAMBA model. Um, and mechanistically, you can just view the SSM, the, the S6 layer, as just a sequence of three modules in the forward pass. Uh, first, you have the selection mechanism, uh, just linear transformations of your input uh, to generate vectors, uh, basically your parameters BT and CT, which are the parameters of your continuous time SSM. Uh, and then your A is hippo parameterized, like I talked about. Uh, and together, these parameters, uh, so these parameters are sent to the discretization layer, where you apply some sort of a fixed transformation using what is called discretization rule. Um, and this uh, gives us the parameters for the linear recurrence layer. Yeah. So all the trainable parameters are essentially before the discretization layer. So you have these linear maps uh, with trainable parameters WB and WC, and you have your A. These are the only trainable parameters here. Um, so the key question we were interested in was, uh, how do these selective and structured SSMs scale with width? Uh, for SSMs, there are different notions of width. You have the state dimension, you have the dimension of the input to the SSM. Um, you can take either of them to infinity, but uh, here, thankfully, the limits commute. So we take the general case where the NX and NU both are taken to infinity at the same, uh, same rate, roughly. Um, so what we're going to do, the setting we're interested in, is we're going to update the parameters of the SSM using SGD. Um, and the initialization for the uh, linear maps is, uh, is the standard Gaussian initialization with sigma b square, sigma c square, the, the variances of, of these Gaussians. And you have the corresponding learning rates. And A has this HIPPO parameterization. So there are many different HIPPO matrices. Again, the only thing that's relevant for us is that they're very structured, uh, fast decaying eigenvalues, usually. Um, again, what, what kind of stuff are we interested in? Similar questions as we asked before. Do we have stable signal propagation? Or is just we increase the width of the network? Uh, are the gradients roughly balanced through all the different paths? Uh, do we have effective updates? Right? Like is every layer being effectively updated in that it uh, has a non-trivial effect on the output or the activations of the network? So um, how does a uh, S6 layer, so we're going to start with the standard MAMBA parameterization, the default parameterization, which is the HIPPO and the random initialization of, of the weight matrices. And uh, this is basically what we see. Um, essentially, what we see is if you choose any learning rate that is larger than 1 over m, then all of your uh, the hidden states, outputs of the SSM, basically diverge. This is the same behavior that we see for standard architectures uh, with standard parameterization. Really. And this, the same thing holds with all discretization rules that we have, like ZOH discretization rule or Euler or other, other rules. Um, and if you choose a learning rate that is too small, uh, less than 1 over n, then uh, updates to the SSM. So none of the parameters have uh, effective updates. So you have vanishing effect of the uh, updates with a small learning rate. Uh, this is uh, the picture we saw at the beginning of the talk, uh, as I said. As you increase the width of the network, we get strong non-monotonicity uh, 
in your performance. Uh, and as I mentioned, this same behavior you see with other architectures like transformers or ResNets with their default parameterizations. So um, we can derive the maximal update parameterization, which is a nice scaling rule that's used for other architectures. So we can just do that for, for the S6 layer as well. Uh, in principle, if your architecture is representable as like a tensor program, you can just use the master theorems and the, the whole machinery uh, the, the tensor program defines. And you can also do other, other ways. There are other ways of doing it to, to, to get to mu p. Uh, issue though is S6 layer is actually not TP representable. I can sort of give like a, a quick uh, overview of, uh, for why. This also causes an issue for like other techniques, actually. So one key non-trivial insight from the tensor programs is that as you increase the width of the network to infinity, um, the, your activations of the network, um, which are called vectors in a tensor program, become asymptotically IID. So they behave like IID samples from some coordinate distribution. Uh, and the, the key reason why you can't represent this as a DB is because activations in the S6 layer, the hidden states in particular, they're neither independent nor identically distributed, even asymptotically. Um, and two reasons for this, like first, uh, HIPPO matrices are like super highly structured, so you have uh, very uh, you know non identically distributed activations through HIPPO matrices, and selection mechanism actually introduces strong correlations uh, between the coordinates of the hidden states. So this uh, you know uh, prevents you from having such a coordinate distribution with IID uh, coordinates. So. Um, what we can do is, instead of, I mean, there are heuristical ways to derive mu p. So uh, there are specifications for if, you're, if you have a certain kind of shape for your uh, parameter, whether it's like an input parameter or an output parameter or a hidden parameter, you can derive mu p using, using these heuristics. So we say, OK, what happens if you do this heuristically? Um, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to parameterize all the, so these SSM layers, we embed them into a series of other kinds of layers, like layer norms, MLPs, all the standard things like transformers. Essentially, think of it as removing the attention block and just putting in the SSM block in there. Um, if you do that, though, uh, we basically see that under both discretizations, we have at least one of the conditions not being met. Uh, for ZOH, your WB does not update maximally. So one of the parameters doesn't update maximally. And your hidden states basically vanish, even though your outputs are stable. Uh, if you use Euler discretization, hidden states become stable, but output diverges. So you have this kind of behavior. Uh, and A, the uh, state transition matrix, does not update maximally in either discretization rule. So th this basically doesn't work. So this another sort of uh, spectral scaling. You can also use that to derive uh, mu p. But basically, similar results hold there as well. Essentially, because if you just use the shape of an individual parameter to uh, get derived the parameterization, it doesn't give you the right result for more general architectures. So uh, how do we derive the correct parameterization? Basically, what you need to do is you need to track correlations not only across activations, but also across the coordinates um, through forward and backward signal propagation in this S6 layer. And this is sort of how the, how the final parameterization looks like. Um, one thing to note is it's actually different for different discretizations. And it's also different for WB and WC, uh, even though they have the same shape. Um, again, we can parameterize all the non-SSM uh, non layers or non-S6 layers like standard mu p. And the S6 layers according to this parameterization. And we see what kind of behavior we get. And under both discretizations, uh, all parameters get maximally updated. Um, and we get all the nice, uh, nice things that mu p gives for you know, other standard architectures. Like, uh, you have monotonicity. So on the right, we have the, the, the correct parameterization. On the left is standard parameterization. And you see performance improves monotonically with scale. Um, you get better stability, uh, hyperparameter transfer for your learning rate, and better performance as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to conclude the talk with some uh, very uh, high-level takeaways. So if you want to ensure uh, you know, trans like robust transfer of de design choices across different scales. You, you need to use uh, this sort of scaling analysis. Um, it, it helps us build like small uh, representative models you can use for efficient ex experimentation, uh, for you know design space exploration, and so on. Uh, and scaling limits is, is a very nice framework for for understanding the behavior of even moderate-sized networks. Um, 
and uh, potentially from some of our, our, our empirical analysis, we see that uh, if you systematically parameterize your design choices, you can actually better understand and also compare different algorithms. Because we find that sometimes when you, when you just better do the parameterization correctly, performance gaps vanish sometimes. It also, of course, robustifies evaluation. Um, and these kinds of limits uh, may actually be useful models for understanding generalization and learning dynamics in deep learning. Uh, just uh, concluding with some next steps. Um, of course, the, the one really sort of pressing question is why exactly do effective updates and effective perturbations give you hyperparameter transfer? There's some, some really nice interplay between scaling limits and optimization theory. It's, it's a crucial question to understand. Um, we want to do the analysis for other scaling dimensions, uh, depth, uh, data size is a, is a big one. Um, also, understand the mechanisms behind these neural scaling laws. Also, how fast you're converging to your limit. Uh, so, questions like this. Yeah, that concludes my talk. Thank you so much.